Good afternoon, everybody. Have a happy Friday afternoon. So far, no rain. That's good. At least where I am, downtown, no rain. So this morning, or this afternoon, rather, goodness, uh, we're going to talk about several things, and of course, we're going to take your questions. We're going to talk about COVID. We're going to talk about the numbers. Uh, we're going to talk about the recent order uh, that we talked about on Wednesday, uh, having to do with bars and restaurants and capacity limits. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about vacancy and demolitions. On Monday, I told you we were going to talk about that on Wednesday, but there was so much news on Wednesday, we didn't get to it. Um, and we'll take your questions, several, several things. So, okay, so COVID, let me tell you a little bit about the numbers today. Uh, yesterday we had 66 new COVID cases. The day before, this is in the city of St. Louis, we had 69, uh, 60, 35. So we've been running in the 60s this week for the most part. We'll get today's numbers 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in that, in that time range. Um, there's something noteworthy about this week's numbers, not the number of cases, but what we do is we look at what date did the individual have the test that we are reporting, that we received the results of on yesterday. And I think this week looks a little better than the prior week in that most of the tests are uh, within a week of when the test was taken. Uh, there are a few older than that, but not too many. So that's good. It appears that it's taking people uh, three days, four days, six, seven days, and not too many older than that. Now, one of the things that we know is um, that we still may be receiving uh, additional test results from the state because, you know, midstream in the middle of a pandemic, um, through not really the state's fault, but, uh, you know, they decided to change uh, technologies. Well, that's a tough time to implement a new system. And so when you do that, sometimes you get some backlog and backup. That's not something we had any control over, but we still uh, may be receiving some results from the state. Now, um, those are the new test results. As of uh, two days ago, there were 267 people, COVID positive cases in the hospital. 76 were in the ICU. That's up a little bit from, that's the highest it's been in uh, a while. That's the high, 76 is actually the highest it's been. Uh, this sheet has up to in the last three weeks. Uh, 47 people on ventilators. Similarly, that's the highest number we've had in the last few weeks. And um, 34 people admitted to the hospital. So that's, that's a pretty good number. Not good if you're the one admitted, but you know what I mean? That's not as high as it has been where it's been up in the mid 40s and even the mid 50s. And then there were 37 people discharged. So I think the term that I used on Monday or Wednesday was that these numbers are remaining stubbornly high. And uh, seeing the numbers in the ICU and the number of people on ventilators go up, even though they're only going up, you know, two, three a day, um, that's not something that we like to see. So those are the COVID numbers for now. Still a very serious situation. Um, situation. And um, so we still have to continue to uh, be very vigilant about trying to tamp down the spread. Now, with regard to that, you know, we announced on Wednesday, a new health order, health order number 13. And this health order requires bars and restaurants that serve alcohol to close at 11 p.m. Um, and this order went into effect last night and will remain in effect until September the 7th, which is a little bit more than three weeks, three weeks and a few days. Uh, that's a Monday. That happens to be Labor Day. 
Uh, so it'll remain in effect until then. And then we'll be reevaluating it in the week leading up to it to see whether or not we have to extend this 11 p.m. closing time or whether we feel that we can maybe tick it up a little bit. And, you know, I've heard, I, I, I see the comments on social media and, you know, radio and all that sort of thing. And people are like, well, well why, why 11 p.m.? And frankly, it was a time that we thought was sensible enough to allow people who are going to be seated at tables eating dinner um, or even having drinks with their friends to be able to do that after work or in the evenings uh, and still not be in a, in a nightclub kind of situation. We're really just trying to be sure that people are uh, being encouraged to behave in such a way that they're wearing masks all the time except when they're seated at a table eating or drinking and that they maintain a six feet six foot social distance so um, we know that the highest increase in terms of number of cases in, is among 20 year olds the next highest increase is among a uh, number of cases is among 30 year olds so um, trying to strike some balance here know that it's a really difficult situation for bars and restaurants um, and their workers and um, honestly I, I hate that but we we can't you know continue to see these numbers go up we're in a situation right now where we're headed into fall doesn't feel like it today but you know in another month or six weeks we'll be into fall will begin to be into flu season in addition to COVID season. And um, we really just try and keep as many people safe as possible and put some guardrails up or some guidelines up um, to allow people as much um, ability to make their own decisions as possible, but without encouraging those kinds of situation which lead to um, having super spreaders and a real, real increase. So that's, that's the reason for it. As I said on Wednesday, this is a move that I hope we would never have to take, um, but we do. And we are apparently going to be living with COVID for a long time. Uh, we, we all know that there are vaccines being tested and, and all that, but right now uh, it looks like we're going to be living with COVID for a while. So we're all trying to figure out how to coexist with COVID. Um, so that's a little more on the new guidelines. Now, someone did ask a question. Um, you know, a, a restaurant that is, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples here, uh, maybe like courtesy diner or a breakfast place that doesn't serve alcohol uh, or a McDonald's or fast food place, they can still stay open at past 11 o'clock because primarily um, there's a lot of carry out there, but you know, some people do still need to get some food after 11 and, and they can still stay open um, because it's not a situation with a lot of mixing and, and mingling in, in those situations. Still got to wear a mask, still have to be six feet apart, but uh, they can still stay open. Um, let me talk about vacancy for just a minute. Vacancy slash demo. So in the city of St. Louis, there are um, really thousands of almost, and this was, this was a year ago, so the number's not too different now, uh, 25,000 vacant lots and buildings. Most of the 25,000 were lots, vacant lots, but about 7,500 or so were vacant buildings, and about half of those were owned by LRA, uh, Land Reutilization Authority. Um, three years ago, we began funding um, a demolition program to talk about the, to take down the worst first, is the way I said it. Now I'm looking for my numbers, and what do I do with it? Here they are. Okay. Um, take down the worst buildings first, because I have to tell you, nothing good happens in a vacant building. And if you have a building that's been sitting there for 10 20 sometimes 30 years vacant usually the roof is collapsed in the back or a sidewalls fallen off there are still good folks living on that block with one two three 
uh, buildings that are in terrible shape. So we began uh, a demolition program to take down those buildings that were too far gone to be saved. And I guess I just want to report that in, um, this is calendar year, but in 2017, um, we had only taken down 32 buildings. This was before this program really kicked in. 2018, we took down 343. 2019, we took down 660. And then this year, so far this year, we've taken down about 300 buildings. Now, these are in various sources. Most of them are the city building division and the funding through general revenue. You know, it costs about twelve to $15,000 to take down a vacant building. We uh, initiated programs where we were trying to save as many bricks as possible to recycle them. But about uh, 961 is what's on this sheet. Uh, so close to 1,000 of them were taken down by the building division. Another 500 of these buildings were taken down by the Urban Greening Program, which is a partnership that we have with MSD and several other partners. So what you have here is there are still many more vacant buildings. And every year, every winter that a vacant building goes through, it gets worse. Rain, freezing, thawing, um, those buildings get worse. We want to save as many buildings as we possibly can to be able to renovate them. But we also want to provide as safe a neighborhood as we can for the people who live on that block or behind that, that bad house. Because what happens in a vacant building is uh, drug sales, uh, sometimes prostitution, um, all kinds of bad situations that lead to bad situations on blocks. So we are uh, proud of having taken down those worst first buildings. And this year, this next budget year, the year we're in now, July of 20 to June of 21, we don't have very much money in our budget at all, about a thousand dollars, about a million dollars to take down buildings. And that's just because of the tremendous hit that our revenue is taking for, uh, from COVID. You know, we're budgeting about a $67 million revenue hit this year. But as we begin to recover, we will continue to fund as much as we can for demolition because that makes a real difference in the lives of people living on that block when you're able to remove some buildings, um, hopefully save some of the old bricks out of those buildings, get them recycled, uh, grade the lot, seed the lot, um, then try to sell the lot to some folks who might live next door through a side lot program or through a mow to own program to enable those folks to have a, a real ownership interest in, in the properties. So any of you that are interested in that, and you know, we've got, gotten away from talking about that for the last, I don't know, five or six months because COVID has so um, usurped everything else. But any of you that are interested in that, folks who may want to buy an LRA building, renovate it for your own, um, go on the LRA website. There are lots of buildings for sale. If you live next door to a vacant lot that's LRA owned, consider mowing it for two years and then you'll own it. Um, a very good programs. And I have to be honest with you, we don't want to own them. The city, LRA, we are the owner of last resort. The only way that we end up owning a property is because the property taxes have not been paid on it, usually for three, sometimes four or five years. It goes to a tax sale. It goes in the tax sale at least twice. Nobody else bids on it. And when that happens, we end up with it. So we don't want to be a landlord. And honestly, we're not a very good landlord. And we aren't a very good landlord because we just fundamentally don't have the money to be able to care, to be able to cut the grass as well as you would. You would take much better care of it. You'd trim it. You'd maybe plant a few flowers. 
Uh, we just don't have the funds to do that because we're taking care of so many properties. We don't want to own them. Hope you will go on the LRA website. Uh, and we can post that. Tommy's already on it. Okay, so we can post that that website. Um, and just understand that, you know, we're all, we, we're all worried about violence. We're all worried about, and, and the violence that we're experiencing right now in the city of St. Louis and across the country in all major cities is just devastating. Um, and we're all worried about that. But things like taking down, demolishing really bad buildings make a difference. Um, so you have to do a lot of things. This is on the prevention side. You've, you've got to take down vacant buildings. You've got to have your cure violence programs. You've got to have job training and jobs for people. You've got to have summer jobs for young people. So all of that is on the prevention side of violence. Of course, you've got to have law enforcement. You know, you may have read in the paper, I think it was last night online I read it, um, just there was an, uh, 15 kids, juveniles, kids have been killed in the city uh, so far this year. Uh, I just got a text message on my phone a couple of hours ago that there, and I don't have any details about this, there was an eight-month-old baby that was shot uh, in the arm. I don't know the circumstances of that at all, I don't, but I'm sure more information will come out, but the, the violencing, violence that we are experiencing across this country and um, is, is just devastating for families and friends and, and for our entire community. So that's how I guess I'm trying to tie together for you how things like building demolition, cure violence, being able to um, have a lot that's well taken care of and cared for, all of that is, is helpful in terms of addressing violence. Now, on the enforcement side, you know that last week, about a week ago, we announced that 50 uh, agents from our federal partners, FBI, ATF, U.S. Marshals, um, U.S. Attorney's Office, 50 of their uh, agents are now with the St. Louis City Police Department working to get together, collaborating and coordinating, um, particularly on uh, making arrests in some of these very violent cases. There were two recent arrests that were made um, by this new effort. We hope that there'll be more. We don't know how long this effort will go on. Will it go on 30 days, 60 days, 90 days till the end of the year? I think it depends on how successful it is. But you know that we're 142 police officers short. Um, these 50 uh, additional agents embedded with our police department will be a big help. So um, it, it's a whole continuum of things. Um, what else was I going to, oh, one more thing. MLS. You remember how excited we were to get an MLS team? I know I was. I know you are too. And uh, here we are talking about extremely serious things, violence, COVID. But we also have to take a minute to... Um, celebrate, I guess, the new layout now going to be called St. Louis City SC. And you know, I've heard some people who like the name and some people who don't like the name. You know what? I love the name. I, I would love whatever they named it, frankly, because I'm so excited to be able to have an MLS team here. I think it is um, a, a, just another asset, another reason for people to want to uh, come together support their team, uh, support soccer, which is very international sport and um, loved worldwide. And they're going to start playing now. They deferred it till 2023. And so by 2023, um, we all believe, I hope you believe too, I certainly hope this is true, that we'll all be able to come back together. I hope it's much sooner than that, by the way but we'll all be able to cheer on our, our new team, St. Louis City SC, and uh, cheer on our new team in the new stadium, which if you have, I know everybody doesn't drive downtown every day like I do. If you have not had a chance to look at the construction of the new soccer stadium, drive down uh, 
Olive Street or Market Street, either one. You can get a good view from either street. Coming towards downtown, driving east, drive down either Olive or Market. It's just east of Jefferson. You'll be, I, I think you'll, you'll be amazed at how big the hole is and how much construction is being done. Um, it'll be a good little weekend uh, outing for you, for those of you who don't drive downtown every day. Um, it's great to watch, and they're making a lot of progress on the new stadium. So, with that, do we have questions? Uh, yes, we do. We've got Kyle with us today. Jacob had to take a day off, uh, go to a friend's, uh, friend's event. So, uh, Kyle, take it away. We've got uh, quite a few questions. Uh, first thing, we got a couple of com positive comments about the city's efforts on vacancy. Good. Uh, Lindy wants to know, uh, the owners mm -hmm. of these properties, are they paying for the demolitions in any of these situations, or are they fined uh, if they do not? So, Lindy, the properties we've been taking down are almost all owned by LRA, owned by the city. So they're mostly they are not private properties. Sometimes there are a few, like if there's a city of LRA owned, an LRA owned, a privately owned and an LRA owned, then we and that privately owned property is in really terrible shape also. We'll approach that owner and get permission to take it down. And in that case, usually they don't end up paying for it you got to keep in mind the reason we're doing this. And the reason we're doing this is to make better blocks, to make better neighborhoods, to enable those people who live on that block not to have to live next door to something that's really, really falling down. So uh, most, most all of these are publicly or owned by LRA. Great. Uh, we got a couple of questions on the most recent health order. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of questions. Um, one, does it apply to restaurants that do not serve alcohol? And uh, how long is this 11 p.m. rule expected to last? So it does not apply to restaurants that don't serve alcohol. Uh, I think I mentioned that before. Uh, places, it doesn't apply to McDonald's. It doesn't apply to Subway. It doesn't apply if there's a pancake house or something. It does not, a courtesy diner, white night, do, does not apply to those places. So. And what was the second? Oh, how long is this going to last? Uh, right now, it's lasting until September the 7th, which is Monday. So it's three weeks from this coming Monday. Um, and we'll reevaluate it as it gets closer. It's not impossible that we'll extend it. Um, we've got to see some, we've got to see these numbers getting better. And um, so. Uh, and then does that, Laura asks, does that 11 p.m. shut off uh, also include private events, uh, such as like a wedding or uh, something having a banquet hall? So something that happens in a large venue, most likely there's a restaurant there that will have to be shutting down. The One of the things I failed to mention, in addition to the uh, closing time of 11 p.m., is that bars, restaurants, and venues, large event spaces or venues, uh, have also have a 50% capacity. So whatever their permitted capacity is, their fire rated capacity, they can only have half of that. So, um, so that's the limitation on those event spaces. Uh, we have a question from our friends at KSDK. Uh, Colin Jeffrey uh, wants to know, Governor Pritzker recently uh, stated that uh, residents of Illinois who travel to Missouri uh, could potentially be causing economic harm uh, to those residents when they come back to Illinois. Uh, do you have any response to those comments by the governor? Well, Colin, thanks for that question. So, you know, I applaud Governor Pritzker for trying to uh, keep his residents and keep his state as safe as possible. Having said that, though, we all know that there are many people in Illinois who work in downtown St. Louis and people in St. Louis who work in Illinois. Um, and so there is a lot of back and forth. I'm not sure exactly the context of that question, but don't forget St. Louis City and County have also had a mandatory mask order in place, like Illinois, uh, since July 3rd. So um, hopefully the governor was not referring to St. Louis or St. Louis County. Uh, as you know, the, uh, much of the rest of the state does not have a mask order. but. Um, I, I understand that Governor's is trying to keep his residents as safe as possible and keep his numbers down. 
So are we. Uh, another COVID-related question. Uh, Toby wants to know if masks are required outdoors. Uh, he says that he was in Forest Park, uh, so a lot of people who didn't seem like they understood the meaning of social distance. Hmm. Well, that's kind of two different questions, Toby. So masks are required outdoors if you're going to be within six feet of somebody. So, you know, when I go out, I always have my mask on because I'm going to be walking down a sidewalk and in all likelihood, I'm going to be within six feet of someone. Now, if it's just you and, and your small family and you're having a picnic or you're sitting on a park bench watching the, you know, ducks, that, and there's nobody else around you, then no, you don't have to have a mask on. So I don't think that's confusing. This is really about wearing a mask when you're indoors or when you're with anybody outside your immediate group uh, that, and you're outdoors. Is that, is that clear? I hope so. Okay. Uh, Kat sent in, sent in a question, wants to know uh, if there are any testing sites uh, on the south side of the city. Yes, Kat, there are quite a few testing sites on the south side of the city. In fact, Tommy will post a list of all the sites, but the one that's coming to my mind is the Affinia testing site, which is at 3930 South Broadway. Uh, Affinia, if you want to call them their phone number, and this is for all the Affinia sites, is 833-2777. I think that's right. I, I can't read my own hand. 833-2777. So the Affinia is a federally qualified health center on the south side, but you can also get tested at urgent care sites. Um, those are the two primary places. Uh, and yes, yeah, south side on the north side, uh, central area, there, there are a number of them all over the city, probably at least a dozen. So, uh, so switching gears a little bit uh, away from COVID, uh, Kyle has a question about the $2 million that uh, you proposed to increase rental and mortgage assistance. Uh, he mm -hmm. wants to know what the status is on that. Uh, will people need to reapply for those funds? And where would those funds be coming from? So, um, Kyle, you probably know, I've talked about this, that we allocated $5.4 million to go into rental and mortgage assistance. And we have a process by which people can apply for that. And we give priority to anyone who's in the court system in, in the process of an eviction proceeding. Um, but what we're finding out is that um, that probably isn't enough. And when we did the, um, the, the large allocation of the CARES Act funds and, and other funds, block grant funds, et cetera, we kept back a few million, I think three or four million for sort of a contingency, not knowing exactly where we were going to want to spend that. And so what I'm proposing, and I'm asking the Board of Estimate and Apportionment on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, the 19th, to allocate $2 million of that additionally towards the rental and mortgage assistance. If, if they vote for that, that, that group is made up of myself, President of the Board of Alderman Lewis Reed, Comptroller Darlene Green. Uh, if we can get two of those three votes, then we'll have $7.4 million. You don't need to reapply again. Um, this is just to try to meet the need that, that we know is there. All right, so maybe it's 2.30, so we're going to do just one more question. It's already 2.30? Time flies when you're having fun. Okay. Uh, so Devin asks, uh, Kansas City recently extended its emergency order uh, and mask mandate mm -hmm. all the way until January 2021. Yes. Uh, he wants to know, do you see the city doing anything similar, or what is your timeline for extending our orders? So our mask order is already indefinite. So... I did see yesterday that Mayor Quentin Lucas extended his, I think it's until January 16th or something like that, 2021. It's very likely our mask order will be in place at least that long. Our mask order is in place until we say otherwise. So right now we don't see a time that that would occur. I hope it does. I hope we get a vaccine and we can stop this. But, um, you know, expect to wear your masks for a good while. All right. That's our that question. Thank you all. Thanks for being with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Have a safe weekend. And uh, we, I may or may not be back with you on Monday. We'll let you know Monday. I, I may have to be out of town on Monday um, to, to uh, deal with some legislation. But 
but we'll see. That's still a little bit up in the air. So if not, we'll be back with you on Wednesday. Uh, the Board of ENA meets at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, so I'll come, come to you just as soon as that's over. That can be anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours. And so as soon as that's over, I'll come talk with you uh, about what's going on and about what we did at the Board of ENA. So anyway, thank you all. Have a good weekend.